Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. Um, we've been in a series called What Did You Expect? And uh, some of you have kind of engaged on different levels. If this is your first time, you might not know what I'm talking about. Um, I'll catch you up to speed. We've been going through a series called What Did You Expect? Primarily, the focus is on redeeming the realities of marriage. Um, it's a biblical look at marriage and the strengthening of marriage um, through a gospel-centered life. And so it's uh, maybe not like every marriage book or marriage series or conference where it gives you lots of practical how-tos all the time as much as how to deal with the core issues going on inside of us and how it pertains to our relationship with God and each other. And so um, there's, there's been three ways that we've asked people to engage with this series. The first one is to come on Sundays as we preach through the series. The second one is um, we have this book, What Did You Expect? by Pastor Paul Tripp um, that we've been reading through as a church. And so uh, lots of people have engaged in that. So we've actually sold out the books that we got and we have some more out there today. Um, if you wanted to get one of the books. Uh, and then the third way is people have been in community groups uh, going through kind of the, the series together. And so some of the sermon stuff and some of the book stuff and having conversations around that. And, and uh, I have to say that what I've seen is some awesome growth and change in my own life and having to deal with things in my own heart and in our own marriage um, also in others. I've also seen uh, marriages really s struggle during this time because as we bring focus to it and we kind of realize where we're at, it tends to be a place that as we go to strength and gets attacked. Um, and so I just want you to be aware of that. We'll talk about that more today, but we're in the, the seventh week of this series. And so what we did is the first week we laid out kind of the foundation for the series, and that is um, kind of three primary things. One, um, you are, do you have these up on the screen or just the commitments? Just the commitments? That's fine. Um, you're conducting your marriage in a broken world. So any marriage done on, on this planet is conducted in a broken world. That sin came into the world through Adam and Eve. And uh, since then, everything has been broken and shattered. And there's, there's uh, a, a prince of the air. There really is a devil. And, and there's issues in the world around us, the brokenness around us, that have an effect on the marriage unit. Also, that we are sinners married to sinners. And so we have the pressures and brokenness of the outside world, but also that we come in this together and we affect, offend, and have issues sometimes with each other because we both still sin. And then thirdly, the, the thing we have to land on and put our hope in is God is able. That there is a broken world and there are broken people inside of marriages, but that God is able to transform and redeem. That we put all of our hope and our faith as Christians in the fact that God can do so. And so um, that's encouraging peace. And so what we've said is, in this, let's commit to some things, to, to building, to strengthening, to redeeming the realities of marriage. If you're not married and you're here today and you're thinking, hey, I'm not ever going to be married again, um, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But I think that uh, what you should kind of work through is, even if you feel like this doesn't apply to me, it does. You are a follower of the Most High God. He has made a way to bless his people through marriage, and there's certain ways that he has told us to do so, and it's good for us to be well-rounded because even if you don't plan on being married, you will be in contact with people that long to honor God in their marriage. Okay. So we've walked through these six commitments. We're getting to the sixth commitment today. we walked through five of them. The first one is this. We will give ourselves to a regular lifestyle of confession and forgiveness. And it seems like months and months ago that we taught that. Just talking about that we have to be able to bring up the issues and, and confess when we have sinned against each other. And that when someone has confessed their sins and brought those forth, that we need to be quick to forgive those things. They don't bring them forth so that we have a tool and a weapon against them, but to be forgiven and clear the air so that we will be committed or give ourselves to a regular life, self-confession, forgiveness. The second one is we will make growth and change our daily agenda. 
that we will pull weeds and plant seeds. We'll work together and grow and change daily. Third one is we will work together to build a sturdy bond of trust. We've been going through these weekly, and so if you want to catch up, it's all online. Um, and like I said, we have the books out there. Commitment four, we will commit to building a relationship of love. Commitment five, we will deal with our differences with appreciation and grace. I don't have time to go through all of them today, but um, I do think they've all been impactful. Um, even in the preparation of each one, it's really impacted me a, a lot on a personal level. I try to be transparent with that here so that it never comes across as me going like, hey guys, I got it all figured out, and if you just catch up to speed, we'd all be good. Like, that's not the case, ever. <laughs> um, but that for a week, I kind of get to wrestle with the truths of God's word and then deliver them and allow you to wrestle with them with me. Um, and so today what we're going to look at is commitment six. It's the last commitment in the book, although next week is when we will finish up the series. And this is the commitment. We will work to protect our marriage. We will work to protect our marriage. We will work. Work. Yeah, it's a scary one, I know. You had me until you said work. Um, we will work to protect our marriage. We oftentimes think that uh, things should just fall into place. We oftentimes think as believers, okay, God's taking care of all this now, so things just kind of work out like they should. Um, they do work out, but he, he has a, a way of working them out through the works that he has us do. I don't know if you heard me just now. We will work to protect our marriage. Here's a little uh, verse on work I want to show you real quick. Proverbs 14, 23 says, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Man, if you can think about it on a relational level, it's so true. To talk about doing work in your marriage is much different than doing the hard work. And so oftentimes we can talk about, yeah, we should do that, we should do that. And listen, I'm preaching to myself right now about the things I'll even say we should change and do. And just talking about it just brings us to poverty, a brokenness of relationship. It's broke because we haven't put in the hard work. But when we actually grind through it, there is always a profit and a return. Okay. We will work to protect our marriage. We protect what we love and what we care for. We do. That's why your money's at the bank. If not, you have it in a safe. You have it somewhere to protect what we care for, what we love. We, we tend to protect those things. That's why your front door has a deadbolt. That's why your, your privacy, maybe for, for you and your spouse, has a lock on your bedroom door. Because there's certain things that we realize they have value and we, we protect things that we believe have value. And different people will protect at different levels. Um, somewhat to be prepared, sometimes because we're scared. Right? And so um, I said deadbolt. Some of you were like, that's not enough. I've got 47 guns, an alarm system, an electric fence. I've got video cameras and a turret on the top of the house that can... Um, pick off anybody coming that way, like, <clears throat> whatever, whatever works for you. But what I'm saying is we protect what we value. I think that needs to, to kind of continue to ring in, in, inside of us today as we think about this, because we've been called to value what God has blessed us with in marriage, and even to value other people's marriages and help them stay protected. And so that we would protect what we have value for, we will work to protect our marriage. Listen, uh, we're going to kind of camp in a couple of areas of Scripture today. Um, primarily, we're going to look at, at a, a chunk of Scripture that it might be hard to figure out why we're going there. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 4. Um, and, and we're going to hang out in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to talk about protecting our marriage. If you plan on being married someday and you're not right now, this, this is great stuff to put into place instantly when you get into those relationships. Don't wait until you have to rebuild something. In the, in the book we've been reading, I'm um, on page 234, I want to read a quote, but if you're taking notes, right, working and fighting together. Oftentimes the energy we have to fight, we use to fight against each other instead of fight against what would come against our marriage. 
Okay. So we can act like, oh, man, I just don't have the, the energy to fight against all these things. It's because we waste it on each other. We usually have energy to fight. Just fighting for what I want and fighting against the person that I should be fighting side to side with against things of this world and the sin that would try to destroy us. Working and fighting together. There is a sometimes subtle but always dramatic difference between standing as one to fight together the things that threaten your marriage and standing separately and keeping a record of the things that the other does that make marriage difficult for you. The first is an act of relational commitment. The second is a posture of self-preservation and survival. The first strengthens a marriage. The second weakens it. The first draws you closer together as you learn to protect yourself from your weaknesses. The second tears you apart as weaknesses morph into accusations and judgments. The first makes you growingly aware and merciful in the face of struggle. The second causes you to be increasingly impatient with and intolerant of your spouse's struggle. The first leads you to seek God together. The second causes you to seek escape separately. That's huge. The first leads you to hope. The second reinforces your despair. The first convinces you 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 that you must and you will. The second convinces you that you can't and you won't. The first builds your resolve to stay. The second gives you reason for going. The first refuses to consider options. The second thinks that options are the only hope. The first accepts that staying means sacrifice. The second has had enough of sacrifice. The first knows love means work. The second is done with the work of love. It's huge. It's huge the difference of being on the same page, on the same mission together, the hope that that brings, the different perspective that that brings, the protection that that brings, the strength that that brings. So it might seem odd. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 4 today. Nehemiah is amazing. I'd love to teach through the whole book. I probably will at some point. Um, Amazing leader. What happens is Israel has been... uh, Exile, they, they, they've um, been attacked and taken to other places uh, all over the place. And at this time, it's the Persian Empire that's in charge. It's massive. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king, King Artaxerxes of, of Persia. He's the cupbearer. So it's a pretty high office. You're in contact with the king regularly. What happens is that, that some of the exiles have been going back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, and, and first kind of Ezra and some guys go back, the priest Ezra go back, and they rebuild God's house, the, the, the temple. They, they rebuild it um, to, to kind of get it focused back on the worship of God. Okay, this is going to relate to your marriage. The first focus was to get it back focused and centered on the worship of God. Nehemiah is in this place years later where, where people come to him and he asks them how Jerusalem is doing, where the temple is and where God's people are. And they say the walls are broken down and the people are basically they're being oppressed. They're in this, this bad place without the wall to protect them. And the Bible says that, that Nehemiah wept. He's broken at the fact that the, these, his people are under oppression and attack. So he wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed. He turns to God, and in his turning to God, he, 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 I love it, he, he talks to God about the promises of God, how awesome God is. He repents for the whole nation, and he has a request to God that God would move in mighty ways to, to fix this problem. And not, he didn't stop there, though. He prayed this prayer that's beautiful and amazing as he's fasting and weeping and mourning, and, and then he acts. He does something. So he prays that God would, would do something, and then he goes before the king, which would get him in trouble, and, and says, okay, Back where I'm from, this is what's going on. Could you send me to go take care of the issue that's happening? So the king allows for it. Allows him to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That's chapter 1 of Nehemiah. In chapter 2, he gets there and he inspects what's going on in God's city. The the, the temple is now built for the worship of God, but the people are are just under it. it. They're in a bad spot. So he inspects the condition of what's going on. 
That's chapter 2. And in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, what happens is it goes down the list of what people's responsibilities are. So this family or this group of people is going to take care of this part of the wall. And it kind of goes down this list. After the assessment, he's assigned jobs and roles for people. In chapter 4, we're going to look at is they start rebuilding the walls. They start working to protect what God has given them again. And I'm going to show you how it, I believe that it pertains to where we're at on a spiritual level and the protection of our marriage. Now, the story is for the history that we would understand what God's doing, but I, I wholeheartedly believe that there's principles here that have to do with us working diligently to protect the blessing uh, that God has given us that would be um, protecting the sinner. The center of it is the worship of God and that we would build this wall of protection for what God has blessed us with. I'm going to read all of Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. So this is an oppressor. This is an enemy. And was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, this is his sidekick, this is like his homie. So Sanballat is a a bad guy, he's a pressure, he's the enemy of the Jewish people and what they're longing to do in honoring God. Um, And Tobiah is like his little minion his associate. He says, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall and, and of stones. And so they're, they're instantly coming against the hopes, the plans of rebuilding. I just want to say that as you start to work to protect what God has blessed you with, to maybe rebuild the walls of your marriage because they haven't been strong in protecting what God has given you, um, that there will be an, an enemy, there's an enemy to that. There is a real fight to be had. And part of the way that the enemy tries to defeat us is while we're doing it, just to start putting false things into our head. The enemy is a liar. And so what you can do is you can start rebuilding and start hearing these voices of like, really? You think you can turn that around? You think you're strong enough to build that? Look what you already did before. You allowed it to get destroyed. You don't have the strength, you don't have the, the, the power, you don't have the ability to be able to do this. And they're, they're being mocked, the people are being mocked as they long to glorify God and protecting what God has blessed them with that centers around his worship. Okay. They have haters. <laughs> Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Listen. So we built the wall. I love it. Till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. So we rebuilt the wall. Some of the problem we have with false expectations is we think things are going to be easy so when they're hard we get discouraged or disheartened when we start hearing those voices of it's not supposed to be like this it's supposed to be easier and and, or we start feeling like we can't do it because we're so discouraged we start to pull back we're not called to pull back we have the spirit of the most high god that dwells inside of us i love this there's oppression there's people telling them they can't do it and he says so we rebuilt the wall (laughs) like so they went against us and we just we kept doing it We kept pushing forward anyway, and people worked with all their heart. But listen to this. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, um, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of the Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. This, This is the line I want you to catch of all of this story that we're reading right here. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. I love this. I love this line in scripture. As I thought about the protection of of 
what God has given us. And I thought about, um, as the book kind of goes, talking about some of the practical ways that we do so and the prayerful ways that we do so, I, I, I was brought back to this verse because I love that they say, hey, there's this th- these things coming against us. What should we do? The first thing we should do, we should pray that God protects us. And, and we should do something about it. We should actually act and move on it. I think too often what we do, yes, we're fully dependent on God moving. Yes, yes, and amen. But part of that is saying, God, I believe so much that you're going to protect us that I'm going to do something that shows that I believe you're going to work through us to do so. And so they prayed about it, and then they posted a guard there. It's like when um, somebody will say, like, I'm just praying for a job or whatever it is. I'm just praying for a job. Cool. Do that. God is your provider. Now go bust your tail to get a job. Knock down every door and then knock on them again tomorrow and the next day. And tell somebody, somebody's going to give you a job because you're showing up more consistently than half their employees. (laughs) Right? Like if you, yes, pray, pray like crazy. And then walk in wisdom and walk in his strength with, with, with everything that he's given you and fight and fight and fight. And, and the same goes for relationally. Like if, if, if you're single now and you want a spouse, like pray to God, believe for God, listen to God, do those things, give biblical counsel, and then keep your eyes open. Pay attention, go places where you can find somebody that loves Jesus. I don't know, church seems like a good fit. <laughs> Okay, I can't even get out of that. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> but, but listen to me. God has not called us just to, yes, he's the one that does all the work. Yes, he's the one that gets all the credit. Yes, we can do nothing without him. And yes, he calls us to move and act and do. And so in talking about protecting our marriage, we're going to talk about both sides, the practical and, and, and the prayerful. That there is this piece that, you know what, we get out and we put in work. Because, because everything worth having took, takes work to do. Our salvation, it might not have been on our works, but it was on the most powerful work that's ever happened on the planet. It's on the works of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so that if, if we think that something beautiful is going to come from us not working at it, I just think we're, we wouldn't apply that to any area of our, other area of our life. Yeah. Hmm. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is giving out. They were tired, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. They were discouraged. We can do that sometimes. If you're in a marriage right now and it's hard and you're struggling, keep fighting. Quit fighting in your own power, but put it in God, but keep fighting. We can get tired. You will get tired. You can get discouraged looking around and going like, look it, there's rubble everywhere. Like, we've broken this thing before. It's been attacked before. Keep going. Don't let those things discourage you. Put your hope back in who God is, not in your own strength. Okay. Also, our enemy said, before you know it or see us, we'll be right there among you and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Their enemy had threats. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. I love this. Nehemiah is the man. So all these things are happening against them. The people are tired and discouraged, and there's threats of people coming in to kill them, and now people are starting to believe that they're going to come in and kill them. I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. There might be some certain areas that you first need to deal with in your marriage. Posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Listen, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried material did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Isn't that a cool picture? <laughs> so yesterday, um, I got to give a shout out to some of the guys who came to help me out. We built, started building a retaining wall at my house. 
and it was uh, five pallets of landscape block, each one weighing 25 pounds. There was 560 blocks. That's 14,000 pounds of landscape blocks. Yeah, there's like five guys that moved all of them. So each guy moved like a pallet. That's a lot of work. So they're, they're moving all of it, and they were heavy. And I, as I'm, I, I know I'm teaching this today, and I'm watching them move this stuff. Um, hope, I, I helped, too. <laughs> I'm up in my house. It's warm, and I'm drinking coffee. You guys are doing great out there. No, no. I'm out there in the rain, too, and we're working, trying to build this wall. And I was just picturing this. They're carrying these. They're pretty heavy, 25 pounds. Um, and seeing in Scripture where they're carrying material and carrying a weapon. And seeing like this, man, that's a fight. That's dedication. That's saying like not only am I going to work at protecting in the future, but I'm going to protect it now as I'm building things for the future. I'll do whatever it takes. If it means I need to drop what I'm building now for a moment to just take out what's fighting us, I'll do it. I don't know what kind of little bow and arrow that was. A little mini kid slingshot or something. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do the work of protecting and, and preparing and getting, and, and getting this thing strong and firm. And, and in doing so, uh, I realize that right now it, I've made it susceptible to attack. And so I'm going to also carry weapons to fight against what would come against it. Okay, I hope you're seeing correlations. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. I love the verbiage of some of these just pillars in faith. He doesn't say, we'll blow the horn so you can all watch and watch God fight for us. He says, we'll blow the horn, everybody show up here and fight. And God will fight for us. Listen, I want you to hear both sides of this. There is work to be done by us as God does a work through us, in us, for us, in protecting our marriage. Hmm. So we continue to work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and workers by day. I don't know when they sleep. It doesn't sound like sleeping is an option at this point because they have to be alert and prepared and stay ready. In fact, look at this. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men, nor the guards with me, took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. They stayed ready at all times, were alert and ready for whatever might come against what they were working so diligently to build. That's all of Nehemiah chapter 4. But I want to tell you this, is that they ended up finishing the wall. They finished it in 52 days. This is a massive wall around the city in 52 days. What I love is in chapter 8, Ezra, the priest that came before them to build the temple um, because all of it was around the worship of Jesus and wanting to honor him, or the, at that time, God. They didn't know Jesus yet. This is Old Testament. Um, so worshiping God and, and building this wall, and then once it's finished in 52 days, and in Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra stands up and reads the law. You should read it. I'm sure someday I'll read it to you if you keep coming. But, but it's an awesome picture of now that we have built this thing, let's talk about the testimony of God's greatness and working through this, and let's make sure everything is focused on him. And even when Ezra stands and opens the word, everyone else stands up. And as he reads the word, it reminds people of the spaces where they have missed the mark and sinned against God and each other, and, and they weep and they repent. And they have to be reminded, like, yes, it is a day of you know, repentance and weeping, but it's a day of joy because God has brought you back and strengthened where you were weak. Hmm. Working and fighting, rebuilding the wall. I just want to say, if, you're, um, if you are already married, uh, maybe a word for you today is the rebuilding of the wall, not just the first building of the wall. 
that there, there might be areas that now have not been protected and that the wall is low and that you would strive diligently as you depend wholeheartedly on what God is going to do in and through the works that you're doing. On a practical way, I think there's some ways that we can protect our marriages. Just on a practical way. Um, one is, is just boundaries. Essentially, that's what building a wall around the city is. It's a boundary. It helps people know that inside of this there is safety. Outside of that is where things come against it. And having good boundaries inside of your marriage is healthy and good. It's freeing. They talk about it when they talk about uh, kids on playgrounds. You've maybe heard some of the studies where they thought it would be more freeing by removing the fences and that kids would use more of the field. You ever heard those studies? I thought kids would use more of the playground because the fences are gone, but they actually stayed kind of towards the middle and on the playground. Um, the big toys and stuff over here. Once they put the fence back up around the playground, the kids went all the way to the fence line. There was actually more freedom for them, having clear boundaries and structure, because there was safety inside of what was placed there for them. Okay. Practically setting good boundaries, having things like dates, having real communication, not fly-by scheduling, having shared goals. There's something awesome about um, being on the same page and being on mission together. And I don't mean you do the exact same things. I'm not, I don't mean that every single thing you do you have to share at the same level or the same position but I mean standing shoulder to shoulder and saying, okay, God has called us to some things. How are we going to work together towards that instead of working against each other for our own stuff? There's something strengthening and protecting that, that happens inside of that. I want to keep moving. Um, working and fighting together. Rebuilding the wall. There is going to be enemies that come against what you're doing. There's going to be people in the world that will tell you that, are, are you sure you can rebuild that? Are you sure you can come back from that? There'll also be uh, just the enemy. They're really, do you know there really is a devil? We're going to get into that right now. There really is. Like our fight so often is the wrong fight. We, we fight against things that, that we use. I said it earlier. We'll fight against each other for our own little kingdoms to get our own little way. We've said it throughout the whole series. Like so many of our fights are just because we want our way. They're not a sin issue. They turn into one sometimes because the way we handle it but oftentimes it's silly stuff, right? Like that's not where I think toothbrushes should go. <laughs> Married couples right now are like, oh, I remember that one. <laughs> fight the right fight. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Starting in verse 10. It's the armor of God. Maybe you've heard it before. But I want to focus on it a little bit. Because there's a spiritual, there, there's spiritual things going on, and oftentimes we blame all the practical, and there's, we, we don't get to the core issue that there's something actually behind that. And if we realized that, it would probably be a little bit easier to fight together because we'd realize that there really is an enemy that's out against us. Okay. Finally, be strong in the Lord. I'm going to underline in. In the Lord. And in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In, inside of, in the Lord and in his mighty power. I just want to say, uh, you've heard the verse probably before, but Philippians 4.13 says this, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That his strength, I just want to say, his strength is so far beyond what you can fathom or muster up on your own. Oftentimes the reason that we're not strong is because we try to be strong in my strength thinking about him instead of being strong in him. Okay. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Check this out. Okay, I'm in God, I'm in his mighty power, I put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
check that out. There is a real devil, and he's a schemer. In Scripture, the devil, Satan, is referred to over and over and over and over and over and over again. In our current world, um, we don't like the idea of there being a, a real adversary or a slanderer, one that is against. And so people don't have a problem with thinking that there's a heaven. What they have a problem with is thinking that there's a devil, that there's demons, and that there's hell. Because we like the idea of good things for us. But we need to understand that Jesus talked about the devil. Jesus even interacted with the devil as he tempted out in the, out in the desert. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Um, I'm not recommending you watch the movie. Um, the movie Usual Suspects. Anybody ever seen that? Okay, don't watch it. None of you have ever seen it, so this line is going to not make sense at all. So, awesome. Um, this guy, Verbal Kent, in the movie says this. He says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Because if you attributed what the devil's work is to the devil, it'd be easy to kind of go like, that's wrong, stay away. But instead, if I, if I can just kind of go and our culture totally goes, like there, there is no devil, there is no adversary, there isn't this uh, the evil and, and demonic world and, and spiritual world out there. Um, so if we can just push that to the side, then we can be affected, we can be losing a battle we don't even know that we're in. And not identifying who we're really fighting against here. And instead we can just fight against each other. Okay. From the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil's a schemer. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Check this out. When it says against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces, that's literally a rank system for demonic powers. A ranking like in the military. That there's the devil and he has an army. And that there's a hierarchy. And it doesn't get into what all their roles are. But the way that it's laid out is that there really is, and I, it's, kind of, it's weird, because of any place it shouldn't feel weird to talk about something like this, it's church. But when you do bring up, like, the fact that there's demonic world, everybody can kind of be like, this is weird. Because we don't see it. We don't, it's much easier to, to blame the person, to, to blame other things for issues, and not realize that there, there's stuff behind that. I'm not saying you shouldn't take responsibility for your actions. This isn't like a, the devil made me do it kind of deal. But what I'm saying is like there is evil and there is sin that is not in alignment with what God has called us to do. And, and, and we should hate sin. We should hate it. We should hate the impact in anything where, where the devil and his schemes um, win. We should hate it. I was thinking the other day that the, oftentimes our issue as Christians is we go to God, not because we love God, but we love what we get from God. We know that probably, right? Like my, and little kids are the, a great example. They'll show you what we look like. They do. So Elijah's walking now. He's trying to climb on everything, and he's just getting to be able to climb on some stuff. And it's a little sketch because, like, all of a sudden he's just on something, and you're like, oh. So far he hasn't taken any good falls. But he's a boy, he will. So, so he, he goes around the other day, Brianna's sitting on the floor, and he's walking towards her like this. And she's just like, oh, because he's, we love him. Caleb, our oldest son, he's like a hugger, kisser, tell you he loves you, like kind of kid. Like he's a cuddle and like love to be held as a kid. Elijah, since the get go, is not a cuddler. Like he was born, and we're like, oh, he's like, let me go. Like that's how it goes, right? Like, <laughs> And so anytime he does like put his head on your shoulder or like comes to you other than just to want something, you're like, this is amazing. Really, it's happened like twice. <laughs> so he, the other day, she's sitting on the floor in front of the couch and he's coming like this. And she's like, you can see her starting to 
like, oh. And right when he gets to her, he like takes a step on her leg and kind of like does the swim move to, to use her to get up on the couch. <laughs> Which is funny, but that's what we do with God. Like, God, 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 I really want you so that I can get to what I really want. Okay. And I thought about it even as it pertains to the other direction. Like, do I hate sin or I ju- do I just hate that it makes things uncomfortable for me? So just like I say, do I, do I love God or just the things he provides? No, I need to love God and get me back into alignment. Do I really hate sin? Or do I just hate that it makes us uncomfortable, the brokenness that comes from it? Okay. And it's really getting back to dealing with the issues inside of relationships or sin. It's sin. That we're two sinners that, that break and do things to each other and it hurts. And there's problems there and that there really is something behind that. And it's that we're, we're missing the mark when we're doing that. And, and it's, do I hate that sin has an effect not only on me, but do I, do I hate what it does to the people I love and care for? There really is evil out to destroy us. And any time we, we are fighting forward and leaning into what God has for us, there is a pushback. It's real. That's not to scare anyone either. We'll get to the good stuff. Put it on so that we can stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It doesn't mean we don't have to learn how to communicate. It doesn't mean that we don't have struggle between us that are flesh and blood. But the issue really is coming into alignment with trusting God and doing what he's called us to do. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, it's not very encouraging either. Not if the day of evil comes. When? Like you want to build the wall around the city before the army comes against you. It's a little easier that way. We would build up. We would do the hard work up front. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then then, with. If you're taking notes, right, put on Jesus. Put on Jesus. Jesus. Romans 13, 14 says, Rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothe yourself with Jesus. You know, we're going to get into the, the armor of God just for a couple of minutes. Um, and, and you may have heard it taught different ways. Um, you may have heard me teach it like this. Uh, But what I want to focus on is I I don't think, I think there's some value in saying like this was the piece of the Roman soldier's outfit and this is why the belt had to be truth instead of something else. I think that's kind of cool and we can kind of go there. Um, It's not the focus of what we're going to look at today. I I think the real deal is talking, what he's leaning towards isn't like what does a belt do as much as making sure that we're fully prepared at all times for all things. And that we are protecting what God has given us um, in in our walk with God and in our marriages. That we are prepared to take on what comes against us, prepared for battle. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. I want to show you something. When I said put on Jesus, you're going to see what I'm talking about. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Put on Jesus. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Put on Jesus. 
the belt of truth, he is the truth. The breastplate of righteousness, the only way we have righteousness is through Jesus. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Acts 10.36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news or the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. I don't think he's saying something completely new to kind of go like, hey, we need to figure out how the Roman soldiers dress so we could figure all this out. I think he's restating what he's, what he's already said in so many different places before, that he's writing to the church in, in Ephesus that he's probably handcuffed to a Roman soldier at the time, that he's going like, hey, let me give you an idea. You've seen the Roman soldiers and how they're always ready and on point. We should be dressed in Jesus like these soldiers come in ready for war. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, the shield of faith. Consequently, faith comes from, the hearing, from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ, Jesus. Take the helmet of salvation, <laughs> Acts 4.11. Jesus is, Jesus is the stone of you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We're found in Jesus. That what we have is Jesus. Our, our, our ways to protect ourselves is Jesus. Our ways to move forward and to fight against is Jesus. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. John 1.14, we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. It's Jesus. The focus of we do what we lean on, what we depend on, what we lean into is Jesus. He's the way that we're, we're saved, that we're made righteous, that we have faith. He's the only one that is the truth. He's the one that brings the good news of peace for us with our creator. That is Jesus. That the way that we protect what God has given us is to walk in a way that we are strengthened and ready in him, not in our own strength. Yes, there is practical pieces. Yes, there is things that we should learn and that we should do and we should have wisdom in, in, in that. But we need to grow in who we are called to be in Christ Jesus. Okay, that we should be prayerful. Look at it, it goes on and says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And when it says pray in the Spirit, it's like praying in the name of Jesus. Like when you, when you pray in the name of Jesus, it means in alignment with what Jesus would be saying, doing, who he is, the character of, of what he's about. It's in his strength and, and who he is. So it isn't just a line we say at the end of a prayer, but what it says when it says to, to pray in the name of Jesus, that's like when somebody has passed away and you say, we're doing this in the name of so-and-so. What are you doing? You're doing something they loved and cared for. If you've ever had somebody pass away and heard somebody say like, oh, you know, they, they really wanted this, but they didn't do it, so we're going to do it in the name of them. Why? Because that was their passion. That's who they were. That's what they were about. So when it says to pray in the Spirit, that's not... Um, Specifically talking about, maybe your upbringing would say that that is um, praying in tongues. Praying in the Spirit here really means praying in, in alignment with, in step with, and led by. It's in uh, connection with, in alignment with, the Spirit of God. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That we would be in a constant place of prayer. That we would be constantly in Jesus and praying because we believe and we know that God's strength is so much greater than the strength that we have. That we would be in him and in his mighty power, putting on him. That we would rely on, depend on. How often are we truly praying for the protection of what God has blessed us with? And I don't just mean just for our comfort, but for his glory. God, you blessed me with this, and I want to be a good steward of it, and I know that I can't do it without your strength. Protect this marriage. God, protect my spouse. 
against sin, against evil, against things that would come against them. Not a prayer of manipulation, like, hey, change them so everything's good for me. But a prayer of real care and putting myself out there, trusting that God has a plan, that he's doing something. God, protect me so that I would honor what you have given me. Protect my house. God, protect us physically and, and spiritually and protect our minds and our hearts. And God, protect us. Keep us safe in your hands because nothing can pull us out of your hands. And really going out there in prayer. When things aren't working, where do I go? Do I go to blame? Do I go to practical things? Or do I go to my face before God? Asking him to move in ways that would, would make things right, that would glorify him and would be for our good. Do I ask him for clarity and wisdom and strength? Knowing that God can protect what he's given us better than I ever could. Yes, I've been called to protect it. I've, I have a duty, I have a stewardship of what God's given me, but I know I can't do it without him. that we would both practically and prayerfully do the work to protect our marriage, that we would do the work of sitting down and coming up with boundaries and, and putting dates on the calendar and having real communication and making some shared goals, that we would, we would do our spiritual life together. I don't mean that you don't have your own pieces that you should do with God by yourself. Do that. But there is something amazing that God does as we come together and read the word together and talk about it in protecting and strengthening our marriages. That when we come together and pray, you know what, um, can I have, I don't know who's playing an instrument for me today, can I have whoever's doing that start doing that? Um, you know, if prayer feels weird for you, it's not an excuse to not do it. It's, it's just a sign that we should learn to get strong in it. It just shows us that maybe that's an exposed area and a low point in the wall that we need to build and that we need to work on and that we should strengthen. And, and you know what? Um, sometimes you can feel like I could pray with other people, but for some reason I have a hard time praying with my spouse. I mean, it could be all kinds of things. What I would recommend is do something really practical in your prayer life. If it's hard to start, what I would do is I would make a, a, a very clear, short list of things you're going to pray for. Because the awkwardness often is, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray for. How do I know when we're done? How do I know who's praying next? What is this going to look like? You know what you could do? You, you could just make a small little list. Uh, Brian and I have done this before. A small little list of, okay, here's the two things you're going to pray for. It could be one thing each. It could be you open and invite God to be here as we pray. Then I'm going to pray over the protection of our, our family and marriage. And then you pray over something, whatever that list is, and close it. And it could be that short. But start somewhere. Maybe, okay, I don't know where to read. Um, start in the gospel. That's a great place, reading about Jesus. You don't have to have all the answers. You're not supposed to have all the answers. You're coming together to turn to God to find answers. He is the answer. Worship together. And that's not just singing songs together, although I think that is beautiful and awesome. But worship is, is all of our lives laying it down before God. It's the stewardship of everything that we would serve, that we would give, that we would uh, just do life together to honor God, not separately. And in doing so, there's a bond, there's a strength, there's a protection that happens um, for what God has been planning and doing and in and through you. But guess what? All of it's work. All of it takes time, energy, effort, you know, stuff that work takes. I just need to let you know it's worth fighting for. That we would stand firm. That we would push forward. That we would have endurance and perseverance. We live in a culture that, that laziness seems to be king often. Everything is about how can I not work?
Do the work. Don't be duped into thinking everything is easy. Sometimes things are hard. And we should prepare during the good times for the times that might be hard. And if you're in a hard spot now, I'm believing God's going to show up in a massive and mighty way. I'm believing that. I'm also asking you to do something. Put a date on the calendar. Put time aside with God. In fact, if you're going to bring these things up with your spouse and that's hard for you, you should buy yourself with God first. Go hash it out. Ask God for strength. Ask him for the words to say. Ask him to be in that conversation before it even happens. I'll be praying for that. Um, we can pray for that for each other too as we go. That last verse says to, to be alert, praying always for the Lord's people or for the saints. Um, that we would do that, that we would pray for what God's doing in our lives and in other people's lives. Pray for other people's marriages. Do it. And then if you have to step in practically, do that too. I need to pray. Can I tell you um, just a confession as pastor? Um, the crazy thing is that as far as praying goes, um, I can get into routines that the ministry I do at the church puts me in routines of prayer that's healthy that's awesome with people and the one that I can lack in is with my own wife and kids it's backwards it's backwards but I know that when when push comes to shove or tired or distracted that I, I tend to let things flip flop on me and that this is another message that just drilled me about what am I doing to lead my family like I should. And it's not completely non-existent, but it's not with the strength and tenacity that I believe it should have um, and that I believe it's called to have. Um, and so I just want to just put that out there, that you're not alone in whatever you're feeling right now as, as you work through protecting and building and strengthening uh, what God's called you to do. You got two things on your way in today. Um, they're just response tools. I don't know what God's working in your heart today. Um, this first one's a connect card on the back. It says, my next step today. And what that's for is for you to just ask God, God, what, what does it look like? My walk with you right now, what's the next step in this walk and this journey um, with you? And so I hope that you would prayerfully consider those as we worship. We're going to stand and we're going to sing in just a minute. That'd be a good time for you to say, God, what is it? What does it look like? Are there things that you're wanting to cut out because you love me and they're not good for me? Are there things that you're wanting to, to add in? Maybe it pertains to, to what I'm preaching on today. Maybe it doesn't and the Holy Spirit is just speaking to you. If, you. if it's your first time, we'd love you to take this to the, the front table out there. We have a gift for you. We just want to say thanks for coming. Um, the other thing here is a, tithes and offering envelope um, and that's just another way to respond God is our provider we honor him in every area of our life including our finances um, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for us after I pray we're going to stand and we're going to sing of how awesome God is we're going to have some prayer partners on the side if you need prayer for anything uh, they'd love to pray with you um, after that we'll dismiss and as we leave the sanctuary there'll be an usher with a, a blue bucket that you can drop these things in on the way out. Um, I want to pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, you are awesome and amazing. God, I pray that you would give us strength, that our strength would be in your strength. God, that we would depend and rely on you to move and to act accordingly. God, we understand that you have called us uh, to action, that you have called us to do the work. Um, on mission in our marriages, in our lives. God, I pray that we would long to honor you. God, give us zeal and give us just a passion. God, if we feel hopeless, let us put our hope in you. If we feel weak, 
Let us be reminded of the strength you provide. God, that you would get the, blo- the, the glory for the testimony and the turnaround. I believe that you are working on redeeming the realities of our marriages. God, I pray that you would continue to bring us to a place of a deeper trust and following of you. God, if there are people here today that that have broken areas and broken spaces to rebuild, God, that we would rely on you, we would pray to you, and we would do the work. That you would be the center of it all, your worship, that we would seek to glorify you and that we would put on Christ to do this fight. Thank you, God, for your presence. Your real and intangible presence is here with your people. We don't just gather to, to, to check off a box that says, I went to church on Sunday. But it's where the people of God would, would gather with their king. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. God, I pray that you would do the things in our lives that only you can do. Transform us from the inside out. Transform the world around us through us, Lord God. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.